Who's ready to get drunk and hallucinate? Well, if you want that second thing, you're gonna have to go somewhere else, because that is a lie wine companies fed you all the way back in the late 1800s, and we need to debunk that today on Mike's Hard Reviews. Absinthe, the absinthe frappe, and the unfortunate history of absinthe. Hey there, either ho there, my name is Michael, I'm a bartender from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and today we're talking about absinthe, an absinthe cocktail called the absinthe frappe, which took the world by storm and became wildly popular, and the unfortunate history of absinthe that led it to be banned for nearly 100 years. So yeah, that last part, that's probably what you know. Absinthe was banned for a very long time, and many of you out there might not know that it was, that ban was repealed at some point, in, in the US specifically in 2007. Now, there's a very long and complicated history surrounding absinthe, why it was banned, what it is, and a lot of confusion based on a lot of erroneous claims that people have sort of just gone along with, assuming them to be correct. Meaning, we have to kind of start from square one and discuss what absinthe even is. Absinthe is a botanical liqueur flavored predominantly with anisette and wormwood, which are the two, two of three, I think, primary botanicals that create an alcoholic mash, are then distilled, and then have those botanicals re-steeped into them to give them their iconic, bright, green, like chartreuse color. Typically speaking, they are very, very high proof, but that's not always the case. And largely they carry just the flavor of anisette, though with some botanical complexity from the remainder of the alcohol distillate mash. You know, now absinthe comes from France and that is where it was most popular, even prior to the wine blight that struck France in the late 1800s. Now that wine blight though is what made absinthe the most popular drink in the country. You see, a blight is kind of like a fungus, not quite, but essentially what it does is wipe out crops. It makes them unsustainable, kills them, or makes them produce lower quality fruit or inedible fruit even. Uh, so wine companies had no grapes to make wine with. And as a result, what was available on the market was of an inferior quality, and most things simply became unavailable. Now, that blight didn't affect any of the base components of absinthe, so it became available, it was a readily available substitute, and people fell in love with it in plenty of different uh, sort of preparations, the most common simply being just diluting it with water and sugar. On its own, it was an incredibly simple spirit to work with, and one that people could get behind. It was to their palates, even if wine was something that they were preferable to. This is where the whole hallucinogenic thing comes into play, because the wine companies didn't like not making money. It wasn't bad enough that their market share was destroyed by an unfortunate environmental cause. It's also being destroyed by competing liquor companies, and they simply can't have that. So they hire uh, a quack doctor, whose name I can't recall, but I'll put him up here on the screen, uh, to falsify a bunch of research stating that absinthe is incredibly dangerous and will lead to a condition that became widely understood to be real called absinthe madness. All of the research this doctor did was bogus. Uh, everything else this doctor has published is essentially hearsay uh, and not tantamount to any matter of the scientific procedure. I fucking hate the guy for that. <laughs> but it was enough to get people's attention and people started to worry about absinthe and whether or not it could cause madness. And even with that initial hit, absinthe was still popular until an event that became known as the absinthe murders. Now, all of the information I'm giving you uh, is available in a fantastic tasting history video uh, about absinthe specifically. And he goes into better detail, Max Miller over there goes into much better detail than I can at this moment. But this story kind of needs to be told. So people are starting to worry about absinthe, and I think at this point it is banned in a couple different places, but not widespread. Most people aren't really that worried about it. They're just, they know, the only thing that they know about absinthe is that this thing can happen. Unfortunately, uh, in I think the early 1900s, and I think around 1910, a Swiss farmer who was a known violent drunk comes home after a day long span of drinking gets into a fight with his wife over some unpolished boots, and it ends with him killing her and their kids, and trying to kill himself, but failing. When that case was brought to court after he was arrested, the defense tried their damnedest to blame it on two glasses of absinthe, one that he had early in the morning, and one that he had shortly before he came home. Completely ignoring the fact that throughout the course of this day, he is having beer, wine, uh, other liquors, brandy, different spirits and cocktails the entire time. Um, 
and unfortunately, with the public at least, it stuck. While this farmer was prosecuted for this, was found guilty, and ultimately killed himself before going to jail, the public didn't really see that as a victory for absinthe and instead joined the fringe groups of people in the wine industry in vilifying it. And that became the catalyst for the nearly international, if not entirely international, ban on absinthe, which hit the U.S. in 1912. Now, for nearly a hundred years that was the case. Absinthe was illegal to have in the United States. And that meant that absinthe companies had to make alternatives, which you might know of. They're called pastiches. They're anisette liquors that simply don't have wormwood. That's the only difference. <laughs> the fundamental misunderstanding of what absinthe was and what it could and could not do to you meant that people just latched on to the fact that wormwood was a part of its distillate mash, and they thought that that was causing like hallucinations and madness, and it fucking wasn't. <laughs> because you know what didn't happen? Uh, vermouths, which are fortified wines that contain wormwood, those weren't banned, just absinthe. Utter bullshit. <laughs> anyway, for nearly 100 years, from 1912 to 2007, Advent is banned in the United States, and it makes it difficult to get. People kind of fall out of knowledge with it, and the only thing that becomes left over from it is the fact that people think it causes madness. Eventually, that was repealed in 2007, and now you can get proper, real absinthe in the United States in a variety of different um, from a variety of different manufacturers, some of which were making the same absinthe back prior to the international bans. In fact, there's a company who we'll discuss in a little bit here called Pernod, who makes an absinthe, and it's the same absinthe they were making before the bans, which is really fucking impressive. Now, um, we're left with this sort of mythical spirit, uh, even though it's no longer banned, that people probably don't have a good understanding of. And I think there's no better way to help remedy that than talking about one of the most popular absinthe cocktails to ever be made. In 1874, there is a coffee shop in New Orleans called Alex's Coffee House, and they also serve cocktails, as many coffee houses did back in the day. One of them became the absinthe frappe. It was invented by a bartender named Cayetano Ferrer, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, and it became wildly popular. <laughs> so popular, in fact, that the name of the business went from Alex's Coffee House to the Absinthe House. The name changed because their signature drink was that fucking popular, which is wild to me. <laughs> now, that location is actually still open in New Orleans today. It is called the Old Absinthe House, and I think you get if I'm not mistaken, they still have the Absinthe Frappe on their menu. So, if you want to know how the OGs made it, you could probably go there and try it. But we're just going to make one for ourselves today. Now, the absinthe frappe is a very simple cocktail. It is a combination of absinthe, simple syrup, and soda water served over a lot of ice, very, very cold. That's sort of the appeal, been the appeal of absinthe this whole time. Its flavors are loud and pronounced, but when you sort of twist them in the correct direction, they become incredibly palatable, present, light, and refreshing. And that's what the frappe accomplishes in spades. Now, the absinthe ban coming so many decades after the creation of the cocktail did put a huge damper on the cocktail itself. Prior to absinthe being banned, the absinthe frappe was so highly thought of that it, it appears in a Broadway musical. <laughs> There's mention of an absinthe fra of the absinthe frappe in a musical called, uh, oh god, what is it? It happened in Nordland. <laughs> and if I can find um, the rights to use the music, it's probably playing behind this part of the video right now. But if not, there's a link in the description where you can listen to it. It shows up there. There are just kind of comfy, probably falsified records that people like Robert E. Lee and Mark Twain were huge fans of it. Uh, and, and there's a single account I found uh, from the Moody Mixology blog where they talk about people using it as a breakfast drink which doesn't not make sense, but also seems, again, a little comfy. <laughs> Something tells me it wasn't quite that heavily loved. Oh, maybe it was, I don't know. I like them a lot, so maybe, I don't know. So it being so popular before the absinthe ban, uh, and then having to deal with the absinthe ban meant that the recipe gets pared down, kind of like a lot of cocktails that ended up being in the 60s and 70s, and the absinthe gets replaced with pastiches, which are sweeter and lower proof, and it kind of falls out of the public eye because it can't be made anymore, it's not as popular. And that means that today, even though we have records of the original recipes for these things, they're, the way they get 
talked about is a little bit all over the place. Uh, some recipes, uh, you know, they're, they're classic. They say simple syrup, absinthe, soda, done. Some of them say, oh, there's mint in there too. Oh, some of them call for Peychaud's bitters, which is a uh, anisette forward botanical bitters. Some of them call for dashes of anisette li liqueur, like pastiches or uh, like ouzu, which is a French uh, anise li liqueur. Some of them are shaken, some of them are stirred, some of them are served in metal cups, some of them are served in sundae glasses, some of them are flash blended with ice essentially making a milkshake of absinthe. Not really, but kind of. It's all over the place, it's really crazy. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna make an absinthe frappe in two ways. We're gonna use one of them uh, is the original recipe, as far as I can tell, absinthe, sugar, and soda water uh, over a lot of ice, and that comes from liquor.com. We're also going to look at a uh, sort of modernized reimagining of the drink from Jessica Saunders, a bartender from uh, I believe Houston, Texas? Austin, Texas, excuse me. Uh, she has a recipe for uh, the absinthe frappe that appears in the Imbibe magazine, and it sort of modernizes it by adding mint and lemon to balance out the mouthfeel and sort of make it more approachable for people who might not be that into absinthe. So without further ado, let's go ahead and make some absinthe frappes. So I mentioned that we're making an absinthe frappe and that it really dominantly features the absinthe as its base, which means we do have to give some consideration to what kind of absinthe we're gonna use. Absinthe being widely available again means that there are a lot of different producers for it out there. Some barrel rust them, some are made with, a, I guess, a brandy base, um, some are classic like Pernod, and some are just kind of your entry-level absinthe, kind of like how you find entry-level you know, stuff for whiskey and whatnot. Here I have two different absinths that you will most likely be able to find at most liquor stores. You might have to go to a more special place than your local Megabev or Bevmo, but you should be able to find them in one form or another. These two are Absinthe Ordinaire and Pernod Original Absinthe. Now I mentioned Pernod before. This company has been around for literally over 200 years. 1805 is their establishment date. And since then, they have been making, or at least since absinthe became a thing, they have been making absinthe with this same recipe that they're using in this bottle. Once the bans were repealed and they no longer had to make pastiches that mimicked this product, they could just go back to making the product again, and they've done that. It's an incredibly high proof spirit at 68% alcohol, and is exactly what you should look for in an absinthe. It's bracing and strong and and I mean, borderline offensive if you drink it straight. It's not like a whiskey or a gin. This is some powerful stuff. And that's what you need. You want to embrace that and rectify that. And this is what you want to use in an absinthe frappe. Now, not just because of the sort of historical sake of it, which would make sense. This is what would be used in an absinthe frappe back in the day but also because that proof is really important because we're doing a lot of dilution by shaking to chill and uh, putting this over a lot of ice. So the high proof is going to stand up to that and still give us a strong, robust character and you know pleasant, you know, not too loose mouth feel when we finish the cocktail. What you don't wanna do is go for anything really that's of low proof. I think that there's a case to be said for barrel rested absinths and brandy, brandy based absinths because um, they have additional character and they typically still happen at a high proof. What you don't want to use is something like Absinthe Ordinaire. This comes in at a considerably lower 46% alcohol, 92 proof, and is what I would call the entry level Absinthe for somebody who wanted to give it a shot. Now that's not just because of that lower proof, and I mean, the flavor is exactly the same, it's still Absinthe, but because of the price. This comes in at about 30 bucks. This comes in at nearly 70, at least in my area. And that means you might be tempted to go for something like this to make this at home. I can't stress enough, don't do that. You see, something like Absinthe Ordinaire being so much lower proof doesn't hold up to being put into a cocktail, really at all, actually. And all you're gonna end up with is a really, really watered down effervescent Absinthe, and you don't want that. You might think you want that, but you don't want that. For this episode, we are gonna use Pernod Absinthe, um, the OG, the classic, and really, really top shelf stuff. I'm actually really excited now that I said that. <laughs> I will say, um, I, I do not know if Pernod is having issues with their manufacturing. Uh, I actually went to the liquor store I bought this from the last time. It was a specialty shop near me called Tiffany's Wine and Spirits, who I'll link in the uh, description down below. 
they didn't have any on the shelf. Um, and I'm starting to worry that them being a French company, they're being affected by a lot of the same sort of um, COVID holdover symptoms that the Chartreuse company uh, has, where there's just not enough to go around and a lot of it doesn't make it to the States. I mean, typically they usually have two, three bottles of it, three, four bottles of it on the shelf. There was nothing there and there wasn't even a spot for it. So I'm hoping that they're not having stocking problems, uh, but if they are, you can go to curiata.com, uh, a website that I touted in the last episode on the Athens has fallen, um, as like a good place to go for specialty spirits. Again, I'm not affiliated with them, but if they are functioning in your state, they are one of the best ways to manage getting interesting and frankly, kind of difficult to find ingredients like this. So, okay, that's enough talking. I'm gonna make some drinks because I'm fucking thirsty. Let's go. Okay, so we're gonna make an absinthe frappe two ways. And in order to do that, we need a couple of ingredients. The first of which I cannot stress is an absolute metric fuck ton of ice. <laughs> These drinks are meant to be served as cold as possible. That means you're gonna need a lot of ice when you shake them. You're gonna need a lot of ice when you serve them. Frankly, this should be as close to the preparation for a hailstorm julep, which we talked about on the show previously. And I honestly wouldn't be surprised if that was sort of the inspiration for how this is prepared. It's meant to be super, super cold. So do not skimp out on any part of that process. You need to have a lot of ice. Once you got that settled, because it should be kind of easy, you're gonna need your absinthe, some simple syrup, and then that's all for the classic recipe. But for Jessica Saunders' recipe, we're gonna need some lemon and mint as well. So I'm gonna start off by preparing the first of the two recipes, the classic absinthe frappe recipe. That starts with a half ounce of simple syrup, which I am realizing I am steadily running out of. And then we need uh, one and a half ounces of our absinthe. Like I said, go for something high proof here. Uh, Pernod is the, I think, you know, unequivocally declared to be the best absinthe in the world by most people who know absinthe. Uh, so I would go for that, but I think St. George also makes a very high proof absinthe, one that I think is actually higher proof than this. That would also be effective because it, it, the proof is the thing you really need to look for here. That's what makes the cocktail work, frankly. That is actually all for our baseline recipe, so I'm gonna set that aside while I work on the Jessica Saunders remastering. This also starts with a half ounce of simple syrup and continues likewise with an ounce and a half of our absinthe. But from that point on, it makes a couple of different, uh, different inclusions. The first of which being mint, the second of which being lemon. Now, uh, in her description in the Imbibe magazine, the lemon kind of rebalances the mouthfeel to make it a little bit less medicinal. Absinthe, when you prepare it this way, can be a little bit saccharine, not overly sweet by any means, but it has a sort of very rich mouthfeel. The addition of the lemon juice and oils from peel, which we're also going to put in there, sort of balance that out and the mint adds an additional botanical note that carries it through and is benefited by the coldness of the drink. So to build her spec, we're also going to need on top of our regular ingredients, uh, a single lemon wedge. I have declared that to be about an eighth of a lemon. What you would put like with a glass of water if somebody asked you for water with lemon. You don't need any more than that, and I think anything less wouldn't really make a difference, but more than this results in a very, very thin drink that actually kind of covers up some of the absinthe notes. So one wedge of lemon, and then on top of that, we're gonna need some mint. Uh, this goes directly into the drink and actually gets muddled alongside that lemon wedge to express the oils in the mint and the oils from the lemon peel. And then we're gonna muddle that together gently to express the mint get the juice out of that lemon wedge and the oils out of the lemon peel. Now that we've got that squared away, uh, doesn't need much effort really, uh, we can get on to shaking these with some ice. Now, I know I actually just explained why I do this in the Athens is Fallen video, but you can watch up here, that link right there, that I use two cubes of ice every single time. One cracked, one whole to agitate and dilute properly. It's a tested spec, it works for me, it's good stuff. However, here we are trying to get the drink so fucking cold that more ice in a different preparation I've found works phenomenally. So what I'm actually going to do is fill both of these shakers up with what amounts to about three cracked large cubes of ice and then shake them with that in order to make sure we're getting the proper amount of chilling and dilution at the same time. 
So now that we've got these both positively, like almost overflowing with ice and they're already super fucking cold in my hands, I'm gonna go ahead and cap them up, tap them down and do the same thing I did in the mind eraser video, but hopefully this time one of them doesn't crack open as I shake them for 12 to 15 seconds. So what you wanna look for really is these getting so cold that the shakers start to frost over. That is when I think you've hit peak point for absent frat pack. Now let's talk about glassware real quick. Uh, you're gonna want something tall and ideally thick glass or metal, like a mint julep cup. I don't have those, but I do have these actually really, really nice uh, sort of I guess I would call them frappe glasses, honestly. I don't know what else you would use them for. Um, sort of like champagne, large champagne cocktail glasses. So we're gonna use those. Second verse, the same as the first. We're gonna go ahead and fill these up with ice, which I mean, you wouldn't normally do for a coupe style glass, but this drink needs it. Once we have our drinks thoroughly, and I mean thoroughly chilled on both ends, we're gonna go ahead and crack these open and pour them over. I'm going to strain both of these, not just to catch loose, very small ice chips, but also because one of them has mint in it and I don't remember which. I think it's that one. <laughs> now what you're probably seeing is that this has created a very opaque sort of cocktail base. And that's not just because we shook something that we wouldn't normally shake by, you know, cocktail creation rules. It's because absinthe actually just does that. It's called lotion. And a good absinthe will produce a nice opaque, lightly green color like this when it is prepared with the correct amount of water. I'm gonna pour over our second one now. And right away you can tell too that this is like a classic one. This is the Jessica Saunders. Not just because of the little bit of mint floating in it, but the sort of body and addition to the color that is given by that lemon juice and lemon peel is, is modifying it to look more like a glass of absinthe actually. Oh no! Oh, that's bad. Well, the good news is most of that was just ice. So that won't be too bad to clean up. Let's finish our cocktails first. <laughs> to finish these off, you're going to need some nice soda water. Um, I would say Q, Topo Chico, anything with a lot of carbonation. That's the real prominent, important thing that you're looking for here. So I've got these cans of Q here that I'm gonna go ahead and pour on over. Something about the way I prepared the original one, I think has actually caused the syrup in it to freeze and crystallize. So it's got a kind of foaminess on the top. In fact, both of them do. Um, that's a little fascinating. To finish these off, they both get a garnish of some fresh mint leaves rested alongside the ice. And there you have, ladies and gentlemen, the absinthe frappe, both in the classic and a modern interpretation. <sighs> Fuck, now I gotta clean up all this ice. Bust out the big guns for this one. So now for the first time on the show, having cleaned up our bar space and the rest of my bar, um, let's go ahead and give our cocktails a taste. Let's give the classic one a taste. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really just absinthe. That's the thing. There's not a ton of evolution to discuss here because this is just one way to prepare absinthe. That's the long and short of it. It is um, sort of zhuzhing up absinthe to the point where it is not just absinthe diluted with sugar and water, but absinthe sort of embraced and, and emboldened and given effervescence and chilling. It's, it's really good though. I still don't see how in the Moody Mixology blog they mentioned it became a breakfast drink. I still don't quite see that, but it is bracing and light and refreshing and sweet with these really nice herbal notes. If you like botanicals, that is right up your alley. This is probably, if you like, you know, anisette flavors and, and the botanicals that go along with them, that is probably the cocktail for you. That is quite, quite good. And, it, and it's unassuming, but classy and fascinating. It's, it's old, but in a good way. Let's go ahead and move over to our Jessica Saunders reimagining of it. Uh, you can see here, it's actually held a significantly more opaque color, probably from the lemon that uh, was both uh, muddled and then incredibly heavily agitated by ice. Um, let's go ahead and give it a sip. Ooh, 
fun. <laughs> if this is a method to prepare absinthe as if it were a cocktail, this is turning absinthe into a cocktail. There's a very fine line between those things, but what this is doing is rectifying the spirit and allowing it to be enjoyed in a palatable and interesting way. This is taking it and enhancing it and modifying it, a clear delineation between old school cocktail technique and modern cocktail technique. It is light, still very light, but it's got this nice citrusy, a kind of uh, oily lemon peelness to it. And the mint is sort of reinforcing that chilling that we did and, and adding an additional herbal note to the botanical bouquet of the absinthe. It's really, really fascinating. Uh, and it actually does improve the mouthfeel quite a bit because here in the original, it is seeming kind of thick in a medicinal way. Not that it tastes like medicine, though some of you may have that affiliation. It, it's just kind of on the palate, very, very thick, even with that effervescence. I think if you were to do this with just regular water, it, it wouldn't hold a candle to any other cocktail. The effervescence is what makes this palatable, but it's still very, very heavy. The improvements made here by Miss Saunders, who I think you are a genius, frankly, for having done this so eloquently, really kind of balance it out. It lengthens it a little bit with some of that citrus uh, citrus juice and then adds some complimentary flavors and really just removes that sort of medicinal thickness on your tongue. It's really, really nice. It's a very good preparation for the spirit. It and, and it's still not like shying away from it. That's the thing. This is still super, super heavy on those absinthe notes and I can respect the shit out of that. It's honest, it's genuine, it's really, really good. And it doesn't do any more than it needs to to make the drink better than it was before. That is phenomenal. If I had to pick between the two, I think I might actually still lean more towards the classic frappe because it's just got that, just it's just absinthe. It, that, that's, if I'm drinking an absinthe cocktail, I wanna taste absinthe. I want it to be the thing I drink. And if this is how I choose to prepare it, then that is the way to go. This is nice and definitely more approachable for people with less palates, <laughs> palates that are less so from the 18th century or 19th century, whatever the fuck. But that is definitely the way you'd wanna go if you were getting this out of the bar somewhere. Both are valid and worthy of existing and I am happy to have shown you them both on this episode of Mike's Art Reviews. So thank you guys all so much for watching. Uh, I have two cocktails to finish now and hopefully you find that interesting enough to click that like button and subscribe. I'm making one of these videos every single Friday uh, and sometimes they're history heavy like this one, sometimes they're original creations, sometimes there's nothing but booze. So uh, I am very, very hopeful that you will join me along for this journey as we explore alcohol ways to prepare it, and the history behind it. You can follow me on my socials, which show up at the end of every video. I almost never call them out because I'm really not on them as much as I should be. But, you know, whatever the case, follow me if you want. That's fine. <laughs> Throughout this video, I've put up cards to other videos and stuff uh, as we've referenced them. Uh, and I want to give another shout out to Max Miller, whose video on absinthe is absolutely fantastic. If you are fascinated by what this drink is and the, the history of the spirit, Please go give that video a watch. It's a lot more in depth, a lot more succinct and precise. Uh, and I think it really would be a nice uh, benefit if you wanted to know more about absinthe itself. Otherwise, that is all I have for you guys today. I will see you next Friday with another episode of Mike's Art Reviews. Until then though, have a great rest of your day. Remember to drink responsibly and I'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.